Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of our conference with the theme, Realizing the Right to Health of Persons with Disabilities in Africa. Um, before we get started uh, with the day's proceedings, I would just like to run through a number of housekeeping uh, or ground rules. Just a reminder that we kindly ask you to keep your microphones muted throughout unless you are speaking. And this is to reduce the amount of background noise that we get. And if you have any questions as the session is going along, please feel free to use the chat box, insert your questions and comments in the chat box and make sure as well that you have, when you join, that you have checked the join audio option in the bottom left corner of your screen. This is to make sure that you, you get audio throughout the process. Um, we also have automatic closed captioning that is available if you need it. So just make sure that you enable the closed captioning in your Zoom settings, okay? And if you are hearing impaired, we do have sign, uh, international sign language interpreters available. And we suggest that you pin the videos for IS interpreter Natasha Parkins and IS interpreter Susan Emerson. Uh, to ensure that you can view their videos um, to access the sign language interpretations. Uh, just a reminder to our speakers that when you are speaking, you will be spotlighted by the host. Um, and if you wish, once again, if you wish to see the sign language interpreters, remember to pin their videos. So like yesterday, we have um, uh, an exciting lineup of speakers that are ready to present to us this morning. Uh, but again, before we go into that, I would like to spend the next five to 10 minutes just giving us a recap of yesterday's proceedings. Uh, I hope I am speaking slow enough um, to accommodate our sign language interpreters. If I happen to speed up as we go along, please feel free to just stop me and let me know that I'm going too fast. So yesterday we began the conference by looking at the very pertinent and topical issue of the impact of COVID-19 on the right to health of persons with disabilities. Um, we kicked off the day with a presentation from Dr. Emma McKinney and she presented on the challenges to accessing healthcare, particularly in low income countries and during periods of disaster or pandemics like the COVID-19 pandemic. So these challenges include inaccessible transport systems, language and communication challenges, lack of awareness and understanding about disability on the part of healthcare workers, challenges with personal and protective equipment and the impact of COVID-19 protocols on carers and family involvement in care, to mention but a few. Um, thereafter, Professor Ebenezer Durajaye and Dr. Robert Doyananima presented an evaluation of the inclusivity of South Africa's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. They highlighted the fact that persons with disabilities were not included in decision-making around the COVID-19 response. Furthermore, information on COVID-19 was not available in accessible formats and neither were healthcare services. We also had a presentation from Samuel Umo Ueme and Elizabeth Oyewo Adetola that focused on the impact of COVID-19, particularly on migrants um, uh, with a specific focus on asylum seekers. The presenters highlighted the fact that um, migrants with disabilities who generally endure hardship and unequal treatment face even more inequality as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. For instance, COVID-19 aid projects, including food packages from the South African government, marginalized refugees and asylum seekers. Jacqueline Ledubwe and Dr. John Davula presented on access to health information for persons with disabilities in Kenya. They pointed out that the Kenyan government relied mainly on television as a means of disseminating information around COVID-19 
and that not all television stations were consistent in terms of accessibility of the information. They went on to make some useful re recommendations for the Kenyan government to implement in future. Thereafter, we heard from the uh, about the impact of COVID-19 in Uganda. Ivan Mugabe and Joyce Harriet Nanyanga focused on the negative impact of lockdown and social distancing measures on persons with disabilities in Uganda. For example, restrictions on movement affect the ability of persons with disabilities to, uh, to access health care. The session after lunch shifted focus onto the place of global and regional jurisprudence in the interpretation and application of the right to health of persons with disabilities. Beryl Orao and Paul Ochieng Juma examined the extent to which global and regional jurisprudence on the right to health is reflected in the jurisprudence of the Kenyan courts. They noted that the impact of international and regional human rights instruments on human rights practices at national level is negligible and went on to recommend that the courts take heed of international and regional jurisprudence on the right to health. Dr. Uzoma Prince Oparaku and Dr. Ngozi Chuma Ume then presented on the Discrimination Against Persons with Disabilities Prohibition Act in Nigeria and its provisions on securing equitable access to healthcare services for persons with disabilities. The next session focused on financing healthcare for persons with disabilities in Africa. Professor Edwin Abuya and Naomi Njuguna presented on financing reproductive health programs in particular. Dr. Rupanand Mahaju presented on welfare state practices versus constitutional protection in the protection of the right to health of persons with disabilities in Mauritius. Bernadette Muyomi then gave the final presentation in that session on the nexus of disability, poverty, and health inequalities for persons with disabilities in Kenya. The final session of the day was in the form of a workshop on mental health law. Felicity Kalunga and Chipongkata presented on the Mwewa and others v. Attorney General and another, which is a decision in Zambia on mental health reform. Finally, we had a presentation from William Aseka, who presented on the mental health reform in Zambia and also touched on the Mwewa case. And his presentation marked the end of the proceedings for day one. So today is the final day of the conference and we have uh, lined up a series of exciting topics for discussion as well. The first section, session that we will have is on sexual and reproductive health rights of persons with disabilities. I will introduce the speakers first and then ask that each of them speak in turn. We will then have a question and answer session at the end of all the three presentations. However, I remind you that you are still free to use the chat box function if you have any thoughts, questions, or comments as the presentations are going along. So the first presentation that we will have this morning is titled, The Right of Adolescent Girls and Inter with inter I beg your pardon, I'll start again. The right of adolescent girls with intellectual disabilities in Africa to access contraceptives. And this is a joint presentation by Dr. Godfrey D. Kangaude and Dr. Nkata Murungi. Murungi. I am advised that um, Dr. Kangaude is not able to be with us this morning, so the presentation will be made by Dr. Nkata Murungi. For the sake of time, I will only read out Dr. Nkata Murungi's biography. And I direct you to uh, Dr. Godfrey Kangaude's uh, biography, which is also in the biography document that you will have received with your conference pack. Uh, you can refer to that as well in your own time. Dr. Nkata Murungi is an assistant director of the Center for Human Rights and a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Law at the University of Pretoria. She holds a Master of Laws, LLM in Human Rights and Democratization in Africa from the University of Pretoria, 
and a doctorate in law from the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. She oversees the center's women's rights, disability rights, and children's rights units. Dr. Murungi is, quali is a qualified advocate of the Kenyan bar and a lecturer and researcher in human rights with a keen focus on the rights of vulnerable groups such as children, women, and persons with disabilities and sexual and reproductive health rights. She has extensive experience in Pan-African human rights progr programming and advocacy, civil society engagement with the African Union and its mechanisms, as well as human rights research, particularly in Africa. Her research covers a range of human rights issues, including child rights, education, sexual and reproductive health rights of women and girls in Africa, disability rights, and access to justice. The second presentation of, the de of, of this session is titled Experiences of Children and Adolescents with Communication Challenges in Accessing Sexual and Reproductive Health Services in Hopley, Zimbabwe during the COVID-19 pandemic. The, the presentation was prepared jointly by Adam Mukushi and Peter Chinamora. However, only Adam Mukushi will be presenting this morning, hence I will only read out Adam Mukushi's biography. Adam Tafatswa Mukushi is a holder of a Bachelor of Social Work degree from Bindura University of Science Education in Zimbabwe, a Master of Social Work from the University of Limpopo in South Africa, and an executive certificate in program and project management from the University of Zimbabwe. He is currently a PhD candidate from the universe, at the University of Limpopo. Adam is employed as a regional social worker for JF Kapnick Trust, responsible for disability and child protection activities. He is a former national publicity secretary for National Association of Social Workers, Zimbabwe. His research interests are centered on disability, social inclusion, early childhood education, disabilities, excuse me, and African indigenous knowledge. Our third and final presentation of this particular session will come is titled Testimony from Self-Advocate with Intellectual Disability and it features Sherry Brynard, and I will read out her biography. Sherry Brynard um, of South Africa is the only person with Down syndrome who has a tertiary teacher's diploma in Educare without any amendments made to the course or special assistance in South Africa. This was achieved in spite of the fact that her lectures and her study material were only provided in English her second language. Sherry has also been chosen by her Down syndrome peers as their official South African spokesperson, and she is a national representative of the Down syndrome international board. She believes that all people have the right to be respected and the responsibility to endeavor to make the best of their circumstances. And she is a living example thereof. Sherry has just been offered an ad hoc position at the University of the Free State, and her book is available on Amazon.com. Without further ado, I would like to, to ask our first speaker, Dr. Nkatha Murungi, to take the floor and please make your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Uh, good morning, good afternoon or evening uh, to our colleagues everywhere where you're joining us from. I am honored to make this presentation, which was supposed to be made by my colleague, uh, Godfrey. But as Diana said, he's not available this morning. So I'll just uh, proceed with the presentation. I will hopefully share my screen very shortly so that I can, yeah. I'll do that shortly. Um, I think, let me see if it will come up quickly. Share screen. I should hope it's visible, is it? Yes, okay, thank you. 
Okay, so um, as Diana said, the presentation that we intended to make this morning is on the human rights to contraception for adolescent girls with disabilities in Africa. Um, we, we have made some specific changes, not, not so detailed, but uh, I will be going through some of those in the course of the presentation. Let me see how we move. Okay, so the, the entire paper covers um, a little bit of the context within which we are making this discussion. I will speak about our thinking through or why we think that this is a timely discussion to have. Um, some elements related to adolescence and access to contraceptive information, as well as disability and access to contraceptive information. And then we'll speak to the barriers to access to contraceptives for adolescents um, in Africa and interaction of the prevailing discourse on adolescent access to contraceptives with some African peculiarities. Um, we have referred to those as some of the social legal contestations on access to contraceptives for adolescents as, and especially for adolescents with disabilities. Um, to start us off, uh, in terms of a context, so adolescence is, uh, adolescence is one of the more topical areas of children's rights, if you would say, but more in the cycle of life, it also supposed, uh, usually is one of the more, um, uh, like it, it draws a lot of attention in discourse in, in whether it's in academia or in the society more generally. And adolescent sexuality is one of the most topical areas of sexual reproductive health rights discourse generally. So you find there's a lot of literature that has gone into that. And access to contraceptive information and services is also one of the more uh, topical issues within the general discourse on sexual and reproductive health and rights. And so the focus on contraceptive access in the discourse on children with disabilities um, is very specific to, uh, you know, to recognition of their capacity to give consent to access to contraceptives, as well as capacity for independent decision making. So for instance, um, you, you find that there's an over concentration of discussions on whether children with disabilities have have a capacity to say yes or no to certain contraceptive methods. And then there's the issue of recognition and respect for evolving capacities of children, which is one of the main, uh, or rather the bedrock of free access to contraceptives is, is uh, one of the most limited issues developed or limited um, concepts in the African context. And I'm saying that from a perspective of children's rights. And then finally, that the prevailing discourse on supported decision making, um, supported decision making in respect to sexual and reproductive health generally, but especially in relation to children, uh, is, is lacking within the African context. So we really largely rely on Western scholarship and practice, which is not as far validated within the African context. So that should give us a background of some of the conversations that we're going to have in the next few minutes. So while in growing, there is a growing um, general recognition of the right of the need to respect and to fulfill sexual reproductive health rights of children, there is very little information in fact on, uh, on what measures are taken to ensure relevance of these measures to children with intellectual disabilities, especially when it comes to the day-to-day -day practice of, um, of delivery of their respective rights. And so we are, we decided to have a look at children with disabilities, um, particularly intellectual disabilities, but we also made a conscious decision to look at children with mild to moderate intellectual disabilities, uh, where the intellectual capacity and autonomy of the child is not really fundamentally limited, it's still there, and therefore the levels to which there might be substitution are, are much less limited. So it, this is just a choice because we are trying to uh, enunciate on a, pr a principle that uh, might be easier to enunciate within that category. Obviously we had expanded it a little bit to uh, children with maybe uh, more profound disabilities. Um, it, we might have some slight nuances which I'll come to in the, in the course of uh, my discussion. Um, okay, what happened? Okay, so also the paper is very specific on the needs of girls as opposed to all children. 
so that we can spotlight some of the, the contestations that arise in relation to girls or uh, that, are, that are gendered in nature. And finally, what we are doing is really an appraisal of the legal and social norms that influence access to contraceptives information and services for adolescent girls with intellectual disability. So it's, it's an appraisal, meaning that we, in some cases, we don't have uh, the opportunity to go into very live, into, into empirical data that might be available in some of the countries that we discuss. So this paper um, has tries to, to address this issue from two main perspectives. We are looking, as I said, at, at an appraisal of current af state of affairs within the African region, but also secondarily, we are looking at a proposition of how the intersectionality theory can be used to respond to some of the gaps that we noted within our research. And then um, it is primarily a critique of the policy and practice. So if you notice that um, there are also other issues that may arise, we, we are not really going to pay a lot of attention to some of the specific details that arise within country because of the limitations of the pages that we have, obviously. So intersectionality, is is a reality within is I, some of it was some aspects were mentioned yesterday that what we mean with intersectionality is that a person is at the meeting point of more than one identity in a society so you have a, if you have a disability you are female and you're probably younger or even older then the way those factors intersect with one another affects how you experience rights or the mechanisms or the frameworks that are there to uh, that are there to guarantee your rights. So our argument is that girls have a very um, experience sexuality differently from boys, whether they have a disability or not. Um, and in society generally, girls bear a disproportionately higher social expectation of propriety of you know sexual propriety and unequal consequences for negative sexual outcomes. That is just my biology. My apologies, uh, Dr. Murungi. Can I ask you just to slow down your pace a little okay. with the sign language interpreters? Thank you. All right. Sorry, sorry. Um, and thanks for that. Okay. Let me just take that again. So from an intersectionality perspective, our argument is that um, these girls have experienced sexuality differently from boys and that they have, they bear more consequences, mostly negative consequences, of negative sexual outcomes, and that they also have an unequal burden for sexual propriety in society. And disability and childhood are both conditions of vulnerability. So obviously that presents us with a, an intersectionality situation. And adolescents with disabilities tend to deal with marginalization in both the child rights protections and disability frameworks. What we mean is that they don't find sufficient protection in either of these mechanisms of these frameworks. So when you go to the child rights frameworks, you find that disability is addressed almost at the peripheries. When you go to the disability frameworks, you find that the rights of girls, and particularly girls with intellectual disabilities, are actually in the margins of the disability discourse itself. So as such, facilitating access to information and services for adolescent girls with intellectual disabilities requires that you have, you take into account those intersectionalities, and then you look at um, access policy from the point of view of a girl who has a disability, which is intellectual in nature, and therefore how do those factors um, jointly interact? Okay, so let me uh, move to the, the normative basis on which we are uh, proposing to take this discussion. We are obviously departing from a point of view of children's rights. And being children's rights, we are saying children's rights because we are talking about adolescents. And though that spreads from 10 to 19, our focus really is especially those who are between 10 and 18, which would be within the children's rights framework. It's generally understood that um, the right to contraceptive, access to contraceptive information or access to contraceptives themselves is not a specific right under any of these frameworks, but it is derived uh, from existing rights, such as the right to health, for instance. You can find um, a lot of that information and guidance 
from the general comments of the Committee on the Rights of the Child. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities um, gives a bit of attention on autonomy in reproductive health decision making, and that covers both adults and children. But especially for girls with disabilities, um, there is a reference that we can derive from Article 23.1, which is on, on the right to health. And basically, the point is uh, there is their right to, to decision making on sexual and reproductive health is recognized, but not in specific details. Same, that is the same provisions that we find under the African Disability Rights Protocol. The Maputo Protocol, uh, which, which some of you already may, may be aware of, it's a protocol to the African Charter on the Rights and Wealth and uh, on the rights on human and people's rights, on the rights of women. So this protocol specifically recognizes um, a re sexual and reproductive rights. But the main thing that I would want us to take out of here is the recognition of sexual rights, particularly the sexual rights of girls within Article 14 of the Maputo Protocol. So what we see from this, this some of these uh, provisions, and these are not conclusive, it's just illustrative, is that there are two elements to this. There is, of course, access to information that is related to contraceptives, as well as access to the actual contraceptive services. And those are the elements that we are addressing in the subsequent parts of, of the article. So what, what do we see as the main barriers to contraceptive access for girls with disabilities, with intellectual disabilities? One, from the normative point of view, from the frameworks that I have just mentioned in the previous slide, there is less, it is less purposive in specifying and responding to the needs of adolescent girls with disabilities in a manner that would um, facilitate or trigger adequate policy responses. In as far as policy gaps, um, what we notice is that a failure to recognize the sexual and reproductive health rights needs of a particular uh, uh, and, and as a part of a minimum package for services for adolescents in national policies means that these services do not actually get budgeted for and therefore they are not delivered. And then a failure of the policy to take into account that intersectionality that, that a girl with disability will probably also need uh, sexual reproductive health services means that these girls are ultimately not catered for in any of the policy frameworks. So they are neither in the adolescent girls policy frameworks nor in the disability rights policy frameworks. So we also see that if you look at what the laws provide, and this is in reference to a few selected African countries, um, Children's Rights Acts, we see that there is no nuance in how the concept of evolving capacities of children is recognized in relation to girls with disabilities, particularly girls with intellectual disabilities. So the concept is, is recognized generally, but when you look at how the law frames it, there isn't room, a lot of room for nuance. You also look and see that uh, comprehensive sexuality education frameworks at national level are not really nuanced enough to respond to the needs of girls with intellectual disabilities. They are rather, they, they are framed from the point of view of a child without disabilities. And finally, that there is hardly any data in monitoring of implementation. So we don't quite know actually. We don't actually know in practical terms how uh, girls with intellectual disability uh, particularly girls with mild to moderate intellectual disabilities um, experience um, uh, access to contraceptive information. I think that will probably be helped with the next presentation, which is coming up and which looks at particular experiences in some countries. So from our, our research, we found that obviously the, the factors that influence how girls with intellectual disabilities experience or access contraceptive information are very much founded on social cultural context, uh, social cultural context. And so we have what you're saying, social cult cultural contestations on childhood sexuality and the inter interaction with intellectual disabilities in adolescent girls. So what we are talking about here is that in and of itself, childhood and sexuality 
is a contested area within African, um, in the African society, and particularly in as far as, you know, policy formulation, it's not perceived that children are sexual, and therefore sexual and reproductive information, including access to um, uh, contraceptive information, is not tailored to children, which would include adolescents. So in this specific cases, what you are saying is, because of the way childhood is understood within the African context, the idea of access to contraceptives is not readily embraced within um, our laws and our policies. But then to add to that, the interaction of disability, childhood and sexuality um, is even more, you know, the, there is in that context, there is even a more entrenched asexuality of children with disabilities. What we mean is that in most cases, uh, when children with disabilities come across service providers, the most obvious identity that, um, that is, that is um, apparent to the service provider is the disability. And then secondarily, the childhood of the person in before them, before their sexuality can become an issue. So there is an even more entrenched asexuality of children with disabilities, but especially of children with intellectual disabilities. So what we see emerging from that social cultural context is that um, the recognition of adolescent sexuality is from the perspective of a need from, for protection. So overall, that adolescents will be, uh, will, will access or will be provided with sexual and reproductive health rights, either the information or service from a protection perspective. And that, Contraceptive access does not generally does not include adolescents, much less adolescents with disabilities. And in most of the policy frameworks that, that we looked at, there is hardly any reference to contraceptive access in disability rights frameworks, nor in relation to adolescents. So when you talk about the adolescents, the, con the access to services would tend to speak about you know, education and education materials. And the manner in which that is framed is not from a, a right to contraceptive information or contraceptive access. Um, so given that background, we think that this is what would change if we used, if we applied a, an intersectionality theory to the current circumstances. Um, just as a manner of introduction, intersectionality theory as an approach is, is um, is an approach to understanding intra-group differences and recognizing the distinct experiences of different individuals and groups who have different identities. So what we are trying to say is that beyond just looking at adolescent um, access to contraceptives, which is, is topical and is all out there, we need to recognize that girls experience that um, right very differently. And when those girls are part of another uh, marginalized group, such as girls with disabilities, then their experience is even further removed from the general discourse on access to contraceptives. But when, when uh, that group is even more within the adolescent access, uh, within the adolescents with disabilities, you're looking at adolescents with intellectual disabilities, it is essential that we, are, we depart from the point of view of that firm marginalization. So that is where the intersectionality theory comes to play. And what we are arguing is that a one size fits all approach of ensuring the protection of rights for children does not work. So when, you, when, you, when we generally say that all adolescents have a right to access to contraceptives, it does not mean that adolescents with disabilities will in fact benefit from that access. So as applied to this discussion, we would say that uh, to, to ensure that adolescents with intellectual disabilities can benefit from protections or recognition of their right to access contraceptives, that it is necessary that you specify policy standards that recognize their specific peculiarities, um, the peculiarities of their experience. And this, for instance, has to do with how autonomous are they? You know, if you stipulate in law that access to contraceptives is subject to, for instance, parental consent. Um, the argument from the Committee on the Rights of a Child is that it shouldn't be. 
you know, it should not be with the consent of parental uh, of the parents. It should be free. Adolescents should rather be able to access these services freely without need for reference to other people. Now, if you are an adolescent with a disability, you're probably dependent on someone else in the first place to access any health care. How does that play out for an adolescent with intellectual disability? Is it realistic to define it in that way as the committee has guided? Clearly, it doesn't seem to work in, in similar manner. And secondly, there is need for nuance in the normative and practical formulation of the policy um, and practical guidance. So for instance, general references in national policy to in, in, in national policy on access to contraceptives will not, you know, will not deliver the services to adolescents with intellectual disabilities. So there is really need to ensure that we do not reference adolescents in as far as sexual and reproductive health rights is concerned as a homogeneous group, because that actually undermines access for adolescents with disabilities. Um, and in closing, um, our article is, is mostly a contextual analysis of how the norms are formulated at a global level and particularly at a Pan-African level from the charter perspective and then to how the committee has interpreted this, this right in, in engagement with states. And we look at this from, um, you know, in relation to adolescent girls with intellectual disabilities, being very deliberate about uh, our critique of how the committee analyzes disability from a homogeneous perspective. And then it is evident that mere recognition of sexual reproductive rights for adolescents without purposively applying an intersectionality approach um, is, does, not, does not deliver rights to, to sexual reproductive health rights of girls. Um, obviously in our discussion, what we have taken, the position we are, we are taking is that we are using contraceptive access only as an illustration of the broader um, group of sexual rights, especially of adolescents. So this is, it's not just exclusive to contraceptive access, where we are using contraceptive access as an entry point to the discussion on sexual rights generally. Finally, that an intersectionality approach would facilitate inclusive policies and practices that allow, one, the enforcement of the rights of girls with intellectual disabilities to access contraceptive information and services. It would also help us to gather and apply monitoring tools on access to these services. And finally, it would provide a basis for policy responses to the peculiar needs of adolescent girls with intellectual disabilities. Um, yeah, that is really the essence of our article. Um, a lot of the detail uh, is not obviously uh, presented here, but I would hope that I can clarify um, later if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Murungi, for that uh, insightful uh, presentation. Um, I'm just reminded of the, pres the opening remarks that were given yesterday by the special UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health. And she stated that um, the right to health of persons with disabilities, in particular sexual and reproductive health rights, was one of the things that she wanted to focus on as part of her mandate. And I think that the issues that you've highlighted um, this morning in your presentation, particularly around intersectionality um, and how no one size fits all, uh, you know, uh, I think everything that you've shared and highlighted with us will be, would be useful um, in taking the work forward on ensuring that persons with disabilities can access the right to sexual and reproductive health. So thank you, uh, Dr. Murungi. We are most grateful for your time. Um, I would like to invite uh, next uh, to speak for us, uh, Adam. Adam Mukushi, who's going to speak on experiences of children and adolescents with communication challenges in accessing sexual and reproductive health services in Hopley, Zimbabwe during the COVID-19 pandemic. Adam Mukushi, welcome. Please take the floor. Thank you. Thank May you, Diana. Kindly, thank you. May I remind you just to uh, pace yourself when you speak, just speak slowly so that um, the sign language interpreters can keep up. Thank you very much. 
Okay, thank you, Diana, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to be presenting on uh, behalf of myself and uh, my colleague, Mr. Peter Shinamora, who is uh, not available. Uh, let me just share my uh, screen. Uh, so, as highlighted, our research is titled uh, Experiences of uh, Children and Adolescents with uh, Communication Challenges in Accessing Sexual and Reproductive Health Services in Hopli, Zimbabwe during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, in terms of uh, the presentation, we are going to just uh, introduce our study. Then we do a bit of background, uh, specifically looking at uh, the, the area that uh, the study was conducted in, uh, that is uh, hopefully, and also some of the measures that we put in place uh, to prevent the spread of uh, the COVID-19, um, which will later uh, reflect on the challenges that uh, adolescents and young people with disabilities face in accessing services. Then uh, for, for context sake, we are going to briefly define communication challenges, uh, what really constitute uh, communication challenges um, is part of uh, disabilities. Then uh, we are going to look at how we conducted the study, the methodology, uh, looking at uh, the sampling um, uh, procedure, looking at um, uh, the, the data collection methods, etc. Then, uh, we will then uh, look at the findings and uh, uh, conclude by uh, giving recommendation based, based on the on the finding. So generally, people with uh, disabilities face a lot of um, a lot of challenges in accessing services. Uh, this is uh, mainly due to issues to do with uh, uh, knowledge, attitudes, practices of the the, the communities that they come from and. Uh, even of the service providers. Uh, then when we are looking at uh, SRH related services specifically, uh, there's even more challenges faced by people with disabilities is uh, there are a lot of misconceptions around uh, the issue of uh, sexuality of people with disabilities where people believe that uh, people with disabilities are not sexual. And generally within most African uh, societies, uh, SRH issues are not uh, really taken serious. Uh, then uh, the problem for children with disabilities is even more serious as, um, uh, as children who also have disabilities, have increased vulnerabilities. Firstly, they do not have power in uh, decision making, then they do not have access in uh, uh, financial resources within their households and communities. So their vulnerabilities um, are much even now more and hence the challenges they face in accessing services are more pronounced especially if we are also looking at srh issues where cultural beliefs say that our children are not supposed to be uh receiving those kind of things or it's not necessary in some cases it's even considered a taboo then specifically looking at uh, emergency situations where people may be may prioritize um, what they may call uh, life-threatening issues. People with disabilities uh, find themselves in the periphery of service provision where they are not uh, prioritized. Then in terms of uh, the area that we conducted the study in, uh, hopefully it is an uh, peri-urban community uh, in Harare where most of the residents uh, that are in hopefully uh, are those people who have their homes destroyed uh, during the Operation Mrambatrina, uh, and they then are migrated as a result of uh, uh, no option, but uh, just uh, to find somewhere to live. And you'd find that most of the houses in, in uh, Hopley uh, of 100 to 150 square meters, which suggests that it is a heavily dense um, uh, area with a population of uh, more than 15,000 uh, people. And um, as a result, the area is a low income area uh, where people mainly survive in informal trading. 
Then following the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, Zimbabwe introduced um, uh, measures to, to stop the uh, to stop the, the the COVID-19 from spreading and part of the measures were the national lockdown, uh, which was uh, pronounced on the 30th of uh, March, 2020. And, uh, under the, 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 the national lockdown, there was an uh, introduction of a curfew, which was a six to six curfew. Uh, then um, commuter omnibus were banned from operation where only the state controlled Zupco was uh, the sole uh, transport provider. And um, obviously, which came with uh, some uh, demand and supply issues where the, the passengers were more than what uh, uh, the Zubco Kanban can offer. And uh, looking at uh, communication challenges, uh, while it's the, 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 the purpose of this presentation might not be specifically on uh, bringing out what really are communication challenges just for context sake uh, we define communication challenges as a forms of disability that uh, affect exchange of information from one individual to the other uh, due to uh, the impairments uh, one may have and the most common types of uh, communication challenges that we we see are speech and hearing impairments and uh, visual impairments. But looking at um, uh, the Washington uh, group of questions for assessing disability, we also find that uh, issue of communication goes beyond uh, the, the, the three most common, but also includes issues to do with where one may fail to understand when uh, others are speaking or where one may fail to convey a message to others. So it also includes people with mental health issues, including learning disabilities. Then uh, we've also noted that uh, the constitution of Zimbabwe is officially recognized sign language as, a, as an official language. I thought it's, a, it's, a, it's an important uh, inclusion to make our arguments. Um, and in terms of uh, the methodology that we used, we used a qualitative research approach whereby we were focusing uh, mainly on the quality issues of the narratives that uh, the respondents gave, where we were looking at even the, the emotions behind the responses they were giving to give a full picture of what's on the, on the ground as opposed to, to, to the numbers. Then while we were looking at the challenges people with communication challenges face, in uh, accessing SRH services in Zimbabwe, we focused on a specific area to appreciate the different dynamics within Hopley area, which may then affect how young people uh, with the disabilities may face in accessing services. So we did um, a case study focusing on Hopley area. Then we targeted children and young people with uh, uh, disabilities, including communication challenges. But then realizing that uh, most of them are uh, somewhat dependent on their caregivers, we also included uh, caregivers as, uh, as targets and um, SRH service providers in hopefully specifically looking at um, assistance in, uh, in the health institutions and profession officials in the Department of Social Development. Then in terms of sampling, we used the snowballing assembly technique where we identified uh, two people uh, with the disabilities, including communication challenges, which we would then directed us to the other people within Hopley who had almost similar communication challenges. And in total, we interviewed 13 children and young people with uh, disabilities uh, eight of which were female and five were males. We also interviewed two health workers from a local clinic and a probation officer uh, from the Department of Social Development who participated as key informants. Then we used the same structured interviews to collect the data. Uh, we specifically chose to use same structured interviews to guide the direction of the, of the discussion while it's at the same time being able to to probe for clarity uh, and even to get some 
emotions behind the, 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 the response that we were getting from the participants. And in terms of uh, our key findings, one of the issue that came out almost across all the respondents was the issue of restricted uh, movements where participants were highlighting that uh, due to the log national lockdown, which actually were only permitting essential services people to move, people with disabilities uh, access to health facilities were, were a bit limited. However, the issues that were coming out in terms of uh, restricted movements were doing uh, something to do with people without communication challenges. People with, um, people with communication challenges, people, sorry, people without communication challenges were able to articulate issues to police officers and uh, army personnel at roadblocks to actually articulate why they needed to travel even when they did not have travel documents. And they would then pass to their uh, service station that they were going to. But for people with communication challenges, it was a bit difficult to articulate issues to be able to go where they want to go. So it was an issue of it's either you present a travel letter which they didn't have, or it was an issue of you try to articulate and then sometimes fail as a result of uh, the communication challenges, uh, the, the police and the people with communication challenges. Then another issue was issue of uh, transport. Uh, in background, I just mentioned that uh, commuter on bus were, were banned due to uh, government trying to prevent the spread of COVID-19. This, however, put pressure in the transport system, which was now uh, solely managed by uh, Zupco, which is a state-run uh, transport company. And also looking at issues where people with communication challenges have to travel maybe with their own interpreters to the service centers. It means that uh, in uh, seeking these transport services, they are now seeking for themselves. They are also seeking for the interpreters, which was proving to be a challenge. Even before we look at the uh, issues of cost, the issues of the competition to get on the bus, they're actually preventing most people with communication challenges who they come with their aids to access um, the transport facilities. Then uh, another issue which came out was the issue of uh, uh, lack of access to information in general. For example, when um, COVID-19 came, there were a lot of uh, misconceptions. There were a lot of issues to do with uh, how to prevent, how to minimize uh, chances of uh, being infected which was being updated almost on a daily basis because there was no uh, something like very reliable information. But you would find that for people with communication challenges, they were saying that the packages in which this information was coming out was not a disability friendly. It was uh, excluding some groups. Then coming to SRH information uh, specific, the situation is the same where the packages that are available are coming in, um, usual prints, usual TV and uh, radio programs, which generally are excluding people with uh, communication challenges. Then uh, after all the hassles uh, in uh, finding transport and uh, passing through roadblocks, one gets into a service center where they actually get to meet the person who is going to provide them with a the service. Communication issues also came out where they failed to communicate or should I say the service providers fail to communicate with the service seeker owing to uh, capacity issues, for example, issues to do with sign language, where one may actually go into a service center and uh, ask for a condom. And then because of that miscommunication, they end up receiving a, a glove. It was one of the, the issues. Then um, another issue which came out from uh, the respondents were, um, Dependence to, to, to caregivers. You know, some of the SRH services are, should I say, something that one would prefer to get in private. 
But then owing to the nature of people with communication challenges who in most cases would need someone from the family environment to accompany them to a public service center, obviously for issues to do with um, uh, interpretation, uh, that privacy is already out of the context. For example, in many African communities, including Hopley, parents believe that for their children to access SRH services, it's, it's a taboo. Ooh. One of the respondents caregivers actually highlighted that why would someone who is not married and on top of that, if a disability would require SRH services like contraceptives. So at the end of the day, young people with communication challenges sometimes would just not uh, tell their caregivers that they need these services and then they end up uh, engaging in risk behaviors and so forth. But the issue here is majority of them do not have the formal sign language, they have the homemade sign language. So they actually need someone from the family who understand that the who understand that uh, local home sign language to be able to uh, interpret to service providers. Uh, then uh, there was also issue of uh, attitudes of service providers which came out. Although the study was not conclusive in terms of um, whether the attitude of service providers were negative or positive, the impact cannot be ignored of uh, the attitudes of service providers. Because I think about half of the, of the respondents highlighted that the service providers' attitude were very positive and encouraging in terms of uh, accessing services. Then another half of the respondents also highlighted that the services of uh, service provide the attitudes of service providers were a bit discouraging and um, uh, negative. However, we find out that of those who found, who highlighted that the attitudes of service providers were positive, they were more knowledgeable on uh, SRH issues and also they had more repeat conducts with uh, SRH service provision uh, institutions, which suggested that with more positive uh, attitudes, more um, welcoming attitudes, uh, people with uh, disabilities in general and people with communication challenges in particular are more likely to, to frequent the service centers and get more, more services. Likewise, those who had highlighted that the attitudes of service providers were very negative and um, not welcoming, they had little knowledge on SRH as a subject. They had little knowledge of SRH services that are available within Wobbly. They had also uh, lead to repeat conducts with uh, service institutions, which just shows the relationship between attitudes of service prov providers and then the actual um, civic seeking behavior of uh, adolescents and young people with communication challenges. Then there are also issues to do with access and service costs, which uh, came out where in access, there were issues to do with um, a mobility, from uh, where the, the, the adolescents and young people with communication challenges reside to where the services are, and also the issues to do with the service codes where some of the services have to be paid for. And uh, like I said uh, in the background that the community that we conducted the study in is a low income area where majority of the respondents highlighted that uh, they did not have the financial resources to pay for some of the services which they needed, including uh, things like uh, menstrual pads um, and etc. Then uh, on the issue of uh, lack of uh, privacy, it uh, came in two ways. The first was the issue of uh, dependence of, or, on caregivers, which I highlighted before, where one is to be accompanied by someone who culturally should not know that uh, the child or adolescent is seeking that service. Uh, I think I highlighted that. Then the second part of it was um, on the issue of being able to quickly get a service and go back home, whereby adolescents with communication and um, communication challenges highlighted that for people without disabilities, 
people without communication challenges. It's easier for them to walk in into a new start center, uh, articulate the service that they need, and quickly leave that uh, that place. For adolescents with communication challenges, the time that they take in uh, articulating what they really want, the time that they take in responding to some of the questions the service providers may have is a bit more that uh, they cannot just quickly access the service and go, which increases their chance of being seen at the service center with uh, their colleagues and other community members. While least there is no problem in accessing such services, they also highlighted that it's kind of um, a negative feeling since the community will then stigmatize themselves uh, to say, no, he was at a, a new start center accessing uh, uh, HIV counseling and testing, you know, that negative stigma that can come and which will actually affect the child even more. Then uh, another issue which came out was the issue of um, discrimination where adolescents and young people with disabilities said with uh, the issue of COVID-19, a lot of statements were said about people with disabilities seeking SRH services, uh, where the nation actually is focusing on, uh, in quotes, I would put more important issues. I think uh, this one will, will likely go hand in hand with the attitudes of service providers, where they just fail to to be welcoming and uh, uh, prioritize issues to do with people with disabilities in general. Then, uh, based on the findings that we we we, we just uh, highlighted, we recommend the following. There is need to develop uh, SRH information packages that are accessible by people with uh, different communication challenges. Obviously, there are a lot of information packages that are there in terms of SRH. Uh, what we recommend here is to kind of interpret or reproduce this information in packages that are accessible by people with communication challenges. This can come in the form of um, uh, a book, uh, booklets in Braille, enlarged print, audio visual formats, etc. Then uh, there's also need to look at um, some issues which are peculiar to children and adolescents with uh, disabilities, including communication challenges. Then to produce information packages that are peculiar to their needs and uh, experiences. Then uh, one of the challenges which came out in terms of uh, experience of adolescents in receiving uh, uh, SRH services was the attitude and capacity of service providers, especially in the issue of communication. So we recommend mandatory training of frontline service providers in sign language skills and uh, uh, disability mainstreaming streaming for them to be able to assist uh, uh, people with communication challenges. Um, you know, as the constitution now uh, recognize sign language as an official language, it's very sad to get into an public service provision center and fail to access a service simply because the one we're supposed to provide the service is not uh, conversant with uh, sign language skills. So we recommend that all service providers, especially frontline service providers, be uh, trained in sign language. Then there's also need uh, for adequate planning at both national and local level uh, to account for SRH needs of people with um, uh, disabilities, specifically looking at issues to do with uh, human and financial resources, where in terms of where we have an emergence, we also prioritize issues to do with people with disabilities, specifically looking at SRH. Why is it uh, like that? It is because during all emergencies, people become vulnerable, SGBV issues increase, but unfortunately, most of these SGBV issues are against those with disabilities and particularly those with communication challenges. Then uh, we should also 
do more in terms of awareness campaigns on the issue of importance of SRH services and people with communication challenges being sexual. And I think some of uh, the work that is currently going on is mainly focusing on the community itself, but we are also recommending that even the service providers have to, 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 to be trained, have to be part of these awareness campaigns being targeted them actually to be able to provide services in a free and fair manner, inclusive of people with disabilities, because most of them come from these communities and come to the office with uh, their pre-attitudes, knowledge, religious and cultural beliefs, which they take to the office and as a result, treat uh, uh, people with uh, disabilities uh, negatively. Uh, with this said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this was uh, our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mukushi, for a very detailed uh, and well-researched presentation. Um, I'm, I'm extremely grateful that you sort of moved us on in the conversation and you focused specifically on the challenges that persons with communication disabilities face within the COVID-19 uh, pandemic context. And I think uh, I, had, I noted some recurring themes from yesterday about uh, challenges that the COVID-19 restrictions have imposed, uh, particularly on persons with disabilities and access to the right to health. Um, things that you've mentioned, such as the lack of information in accessible formats, uh, lack of transportation to mention but a few. Um, so it's been a very insightful presentation and I'm grateful to you. So thank you so much for that. Um, I will invite the final speaker for the session, Sherry Brynard, to please take the floor and uh, give her presentation. Once again, I remind you, Sherry, that we have sign language interpretation that is taking place simultaneously. So please um, pace yourself as you speak and don't, don't go too fast. Thank you, Sherry. Dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to address this conference today. It gives me great pleasure to address you today as an ambassador for Down Syndrome International and the spokesperson for Down Syndrome South Africa. I appreciate this opportunity even more because this year, is a year of great uncertainty. And I realize that my plans and dreams can disappear in the wink of an eye. I have never been more aware than now that my life is in the hands of the Lord. I would like to share with you what my own life, which has always been regarded as uncertain as taught me because of all the changes happening in 2020 we have no idea what to expect and what to plan for the future you know that is exactly what my mother thought when she saw me the first time and because she could not think of the answers to her uncertainties the lord taught her patience and to seek his advice and answers to her questions. She realized that although she was to a new life, she did not choose. She was still free to choose her attitude. My mother worried that she would be able to replace me. That was before she understood that I was perfect in my own way. I would like to use this opportunity to express my concerns for many like me who don't have the basic opportunities to become valued human beings. My mission in life is not only to survive, but to thrive and to serve. And I do so with passion. I have a condition called Down syndrome, which means I have an extra chromosome. I realize that we need platforms like this meeting 
if you really want to make a difference in the world, no person with Down syndrome or any other disability should be excluded from opportunities to develop to their full potential. I am 38 years old and I have lived in Bloemfontein in South Africa all my life. I am really fortunate to have been able to study and to have a real job today. Unfortunately, not all people with intellectual disabilities have this opportunity due to the lack of opportunities, institutional barriers and our individual abilities. I would like to use this forum to express my concerns for persons with disabilities who don't have the basic opportunities to become valued human beings. Many people like me find it difficult to do certain things which other people find easy, but that has not stopped me from trying to do my best. Since becoming an ambassador for Down Syndrome International, I have been giving motivational talks all over the world in order to change the perceptions about people with Down syndrome. I would not have been able to do this without the support of other people. Discriminating against people with a disability is often about not wanting to be associated with them. The more we are discriminated against, the more difficult it becomes for us to achieve. Social justice is not about some normal people being our saviors, but for all people to realize that many benefits they enjoy are not av available to us. We do not ask them only to tolerate us, but also to be less ignorant of our needs. Why are we still being separated? from other so-called normal people so in so many countries and by so many people, do these people realize that their circumstances can change at any minute? If you want to know how to treat us, just think how you would like to be treated if you are the person who needs a little more help. Don't pretend that you cannot see that I am a person with Down syndrome. I can identify people like me wherever I go. Why are parents sad or embarrassed when they realize that other people can see that they children of Down syndrome? We are proud to be who we are. Just don't think that it is all we are. We are everything we are. Just don't think that it is all we are. We just have something extra, which you haven't got. Don't spoil us. Don't permit us to be rude and have bad manners. And handle us the same way you would if we were just like you, but acknowledge our extra chromosome. People ask me whether I am less or more affected than other people with Down syndrome. And, and I tell them that we all have one extra chromosome. And I tell them that we all have one extra chromosome and there is no competition between us. We must all rather focus on making the best of ourselves without comparing us to other people. We need to give each other enough space to be who we are and to live out and to live out our diversity. We need to communicate these ideas with dignity and assertiveness. This will be a step towards inclusion in all communities and also to be provided with the same quality of health care and, and that, okay. that other people receive. We may be a little different from you, ladies and gentlemen, 
but we are not less human. When I was born, I didn't, I didn't qualify for any opportunities, although I get wonderful opportunities these days. People like me were seen as a burden on their parents and society. If we were not aborted, we will be hidden in institutions or at the back of homes. Sometimes our parents are still seen as people who have sinned and who have to be punished. Some people told my mother that if she confesses her sins, I will become like other children. That is why people used to hide the children in the time when I was born. Then society could not judge them. How can we change this unfair practice? I have always tried to function in the world without any special adjustments for me. But ladies and gentlemen, there are people who cannot do that. People must realize that they have to be tolerant of the way we speak, the way we walk, and even our understanding of things, especially when they speak too fast. We do not want people to feel sorry for us. And when we stutter, give us time to finish our sentences. Many shopping centers, public transport, and public buildings are not fully accessible to all people. Easy read notices with pictures will help. Not only people who are slow, but also people speaking another language I would so much like to see the opportunities to health care and living conditions improve for all people like me. I was born about 38 years ago, and my grandmother's friends wanted to pray for me to become normal because they wanted all people to fit into the same box. My mother asked them rather to pray that I would receive the support and encouragement to reach my full potential as a person with Down syndrome. This is where this meeting comes in. Ladies and gentlemen, please help all of us to reach our full potential. You can do this by changing all policies that discriminate against us. I wish for people all over the world to view all kinds of disabilities as unique qualities, which can be a powerful advantage if given the right opportunities. No person with Down syndrome or any other disability should be excluded from opportunities to develop to their full potential. Research has shown that all infants who receive high quality health care and early education programs develop better. Sadly, so many children with Down syndrome are still not being assisted because of a lack of knowledge and money. I demand more of myself than anyone else expects of me. I can accept failure. Everyone felt it something but I cannot accept not trying. If there are barriers in our world, we must try to remove them. That is what I did. I met with so many barriers. I thought these barriers were normal, but they are not, not anymore. That is what I am fighting for. We must tell people what our needs are so that we can be assisted to live a full life. We also need to learn about the policies that are available that can make a difference to us in our lives. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I have also been blessed with people who are smarter than me, who have helped me to fulfill my dreams. I know I am not as smart as many other people, but I am smart enough to ask small people when I need help. Without that help, I would not have succeeded. Today, I want, I want to ask each of you 
who are in a position to help people who cannot fight for themselves to try to change the world of the more vulnerable. We can make a difference by using the policies like the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities to help us achieve equality. As a person with Down syndrome, we can talk to the leaders in our communities and in our governments who are responsible for implementing these policies. We must advise our own leaders what needs to be done in our countries to help people with Down syndrome. We can do this on our own. We need knowledgeable people like you to help us. According to the, to the World Health Organization, the enjoyment of the highest possible standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being. The Human Rights Act helps protect the most vulnerable in our communities. Article 2 also protects the right to life. This means that nobody, including the government, can try to end a life. It also means the government should take appropriate measures to save God life by making laws to protect you if your life is at risk. Now, how must I understand the fact that abortions on unborn babies is legal in many countries, like our own. In South Africa, a woman can get an abortion if she is up to 20 weeks pregnant. If the baby will have any mental or physical disability, like Down syndrome, it is not only lawful, but it is usually recommended by health professionals. Ask any mother, who has had a baby with Down syndrome, and they will explain to you how they felt pressurized to consider abortion. Are these babies less human than any other unborn baby? Look at me. Am I less human than you? It is believed that it is every woman's right to decide whether to taste for Trisomy 21, and whether she wants an abortion. But where does the right of the baby feature? If you think it is okay, I want to ask you, have you ever asked someone with Down syndrome how that law makes them feel? There are so many other disabilities out there which can't be detected in the womb. What makes it okay to allow the abortion of babies with Down syndrome when so many other disabilities remain undetected and are offered a chance of life? Even more shocking is the new and most extreme abortion law which is proposed in New Zealand. This law includes that abortion will be available up to birth for disabilities, including Down syndrome, that there will be no legal requirement that babies born alive after a failed abortion will be given medical support or pain relief. This law, ladies and gentlemen, makes murdering us legal just because we are a little different. Should we not respect all lives? I believe no child deserves to be left to die on the abortion table. Unborn babies with Down syndrome should have the same rights as other unborn babies. I pray for a society where our differences are celebrated, not killed. 
I pray for every little Down syndrome baby who will be born alive after 26 weeks and who will be left to die. Thank you for listening to me today. I certainly hope that my words will help you to make a difference in the lives of all people with disabilities and disadvantaged circumstances. I conclude with the following words in a poem by Samantha Higgins. Please don't judge me by my face by my religion or my race. Please don't laugh at what I wear, how I look or do my hair. Please look a little deeper, way down deep inside, behind my smile. I softly cry. Please look a little deeper, and maybe you will see what's inside of me is what's inside of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherry. I think I speak for everyone that is here when I say you are such a delight um, and an inspiration to everyone. Um, and we are so grateful for you taking the time to come and share your, your, your personal testimony with us. Um, so thank you for that. And we wish you all the best in all your, your endeavors. May you keep going far uh, and, and keep doing great things. I think what you remind us of is the importance of self-advocacy. And uh, there's also all forms of, of advocacy, but. I think self-advocacy is particularly powerful. Um, and so thank you, Sherry, once again for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, I would like to um, open up the floor for questions for our three speakers. Um, I already saw about three questions in the chat function, but I'd also and all of them were addressed to um, Adam. I'd like to, uh, before I go to those questions, I'd like to invite three more questions from the floor. And can I just remind everyone to please keep your, your questions brief um, and just ask if possible one question at a time, please. If you have a question that you would like to ask, raise your hand. There is a raise hand function on the Zoom. Um, just use that to, to, to indicate that you would like to speak and we'll give you the floor when you speak. Remember to unmute yourself and share your video if you're if you're able to. Thank you. Okay, perhaps just to give, um, okay, so we have a hand from Nicholas, I see. Nicholas, yes. um, go ahead and ask yeah. your question. Thank you, thank you so much, and it has been very insightful. Uh, my question is directed to the first speaker. Um, sh you know, the, her work looked, their work looked at persons with intellectual disabilities, um, but a particular focus on the mild, those with uh, mild and moderate. My question is, um, uh, considering their, their recommendations, um, what would she, you know, consider as, you know, the way forward or the position of persons with um, severe or moderate disabilities if all those recommendations are granted, taking into consideration the fact that many of those children rely complete, almost completely on um, other people, i.e. their parents. So what should it be like? What, what will it be like for policymakers? And uh, let me say thanks to Sherry. She reminds me of one 
um, student I had, a friend, a young boy who is uh, Down syndrome. And I think that if we if they are given the opportunity, um, they would do a lot. I mean, sorry, uh, one young boy who uh, who is a person with Down syndrome. So uh, God bless. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicholas. We've noted your question. Any other questions? Okay, so while we wait for people to, to have any questions, I think we can start off with the questions that we have so far. Um, I will invite Dr. Nkatha Murungi first, since she, she, she presented first, to address the question that Nicholas just asked. Dr. Murungi. Yes, thank you, Diana. Um, okay, so the question is, what would... What uh, can I ask, sorry, that you keep, you mute your microphones, please, so that we can have the speaker speaking without interruption. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the question is, what would be considered um, for persons with severe and profound disabilities, particularly for adolescents with severe and profound disabilities? Okay, so for, as, as I mentioned, and which, which the question also has referenced, we were looking at uh, persons with um, mild and moderate uh, intellectual disabilities, but this was mostly for purposes of, uh, you know, delimiting the scope of our work enough so that we are able to unpack um, the specific issues that would arise. And the main thinking behind that is that as as the the, the person who asked the question, sorry, I missed the name, uh, rightly pointed out, the dynamics are a, a little bit different if you're dealing with persons with, with severe intellectual disabilities or with a profound intellectual disability. And the thinking behind this is that um, we, if you recall in, in the discussion, I, I mentioned that one of the things that is not adequately developed is because we, we don't really apply an intersectionality approach generally to children's rights, but also to disability rights, um, you know, like the intersection of disability and children's rights, we haven't we don't have a, a, a nuanced understanding of what evolving capacities looks like. So when we even look at evolving capacities of children with disabilities, we do tend to look at it with as children with disabilities as a homogeneous group. And therefore, if you see the recommendations that, we, that have been made in relation to recognition of evolving capacities of children, of children with disabilities specifically, which most of the time comes in terms of, in, in places of either decision-making or participation of children, we tend to say that um, we should take into account that disability does not impair their capacity entirely. So, when, but when you apply that concept to severe and profound um, um, intellectual disability, yes, the, the starting point is recognizing that every child has a certain capacity of a certain level. However, the, the level at which that capacity exists, is it sufficient for, to, to allow or to give room for, um, for, for, the, for the child to understand the implications of their decisions entirely? So I would suggest that um, without, giving, without being prescriptive to the situation of, of children, of girls who have severe or um, profound disabilities, I would say as a matter of principle, our suggestion is intersectionality means that you should look at each individual's personal circumstances. So you should be looking at whether the personal circumstances, whether the individual child with profound disabilities is to such an extent that with some kind of support, they can make um, some a decision that is informed and that is in their best interest. However, if in the assessment at that point, it can be determined that on the basis of the best interest of this child, it may not, it, they will not be able to make a decision that uh, promotes their welfare. Then at that point, you could consider other options such as what is the level of support necessary 
for the child to still be able to make the decision before we go to the extreme point where the decision is entirely, um, uh, you know, is substituted, that the decision is made on their behalf. So what, I'm, what, what I would say is our proposition would also to some extent be relevant in, the, in relation to children with profound, uh, I mean, severe and profound disabilities to the extent that we are saying that you should not prescribe a response for all children. We cannot also prescribe a response for all children with intellectual disabilities. Whatever the policy says, it must give room for flexibility enough to assess the individual circumstances of each child and to respond to, to those. Um, yeah, I don't know if that, that responds to your question. I think there is a question on the chat that seems to come to me. I don't know if it's the same question. Are reproductive health rights of children or uh, are reproductive health rights of people with intellectual disabilities recognized generally in Africa? Uh, if not, in a paternalistic society as Africa, would the recognition of, okay, reproductive health rights of women be a better step towards recognizing the reproductive rights of adolescents? Okay. Um, the simple answer is they are recognized uh, in the sense that we talk about non-discrimination as a general principle in the provision of, of, of uh, rights, but in practice or in how these uh, rights are implemented, it's then that, that's where the problem is. Because um, as, as the, the question actually asks, you are being very specific. Okay, sorry. Uh, when I read the question, I wasn't very clear. Okay, I was reading from the chat here. The question says, are reproductive health rights of people with intellectual disabilities recognized generally in Africa? And I think from a generally perspective, I would say they are. But if we got into the specifics of what is recognized, that is where the problem is. Um, and that may vary from country to country. So I don't have the time to go into the specific mechanism, but from a regional perspective, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights um, doesn't quite go into the details of women's uh, reproductive rights, but the Maputo Protocol does. And the Maputo Protocol specifically also recognizes the right, the reproductive rights of women with disabilities. And both the Maputo Protocol and the Africa Disability Rights Protocols talk about women's autonomy in decision-making related to, to their reproductive rights, especially the Maputo Protocol Article 14. So they are recognized in the normative instrument. The question is, at national level, does the national policy, for instance, on access to reproductive uh, services, does it recognize, is it organized in such a way that as a woman with a disability, I would be able to go to the hospital and access healthcare without my disability being an excluding factor. And that's the, the short answer to that is no, but uh, in most countries, some countries, yes, in most countries, no, because they don't take into account the impact of the disability on how the woman will be able to access the services. I unfortunately, I'm not able to get into the specific details um, because I'm conscious of the time. But if I've not responded, I can try again and maybe take it another, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dr. Murungi. Uh, I'd like to quickly move to the questions that were posted in the chat for Adam. Adam, the, the first question was on methodology and it was, did you face any ethical challenges? If yes, how did you deal with them? The second question was, uh, it was also on uh, ethics. How did you manage the ethical issues, especially when dealing with children? And the third question was not very specific. It was just, what about mental disability group? Adam, can I invite you uh, just to quickly address these, uh, these three questions that were directed to you, please? Okay, thank you, Diana. And um, yes, of course, we, we, we faced some challenges, uh, uh, some uh, ethical considerations. Um, first, it was the issue of uh, objectivity. 
and uh, the issue of uh, confidentiality and privacy, uh, the issue of um, uh, voluntary participation, the issue of uh, informed consent. So in terms of objectivity, we uh, people who are working in the disability sector, we obviously have our own experiences. We obviously have our um, assumptions. We have our beliefs, which may uh, then have tend to influence uh, the research and uh, affect the, the objectivity of uh, the research and maybe uh, be somewhat uh, biased. In then dealing with uh, this issue of objectivity, we tried to make the research very simple and straightforward so that we only accommodate the responses from the participants and to try not to include our own personal uh, experiences and assumptions uh, with regards to, 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 to the study. Then on the issue of uh, confidentiality and privacy, we, it's, it's actually an issue which um, is resulted in other people who were supposed to be participating um, dropping out of the study, we informed them of the reasons for the research, we informed them of the potential of uh, the research influencing practice and policy, we then informed them that we were not going to publish their names and uh, kept them anonymous, which we then did both in the presentation and in the uh, uh, final paper. Uh, then on voluntary participation, we had actually identified the 16 adolescents and young people with disabilities who wanted to participate in the, um, in the, whom wanted to enroll in the study, but uh, due to factors which um, include issues of informed consent and signing of in, uh, consent forms, uh, three of them did not manage to, to sign the consent forms or they were not willing to be part of the research and uh, only 13 then managed to, to, to participate. Uh, then another issue was an issue of um, question of the ethical consideration that we uh, uh, took into consideration for dealing with children. Firstly, for children, we, after briefing the children and the caregivers or the guardians of the, the, the children, on uh, what the research is all about, uh, that it's not monetary, uh, there are no monetary benefits, it, it can only influence policy and practice. Some signed consent forms and some did not sign consent forms. So in terms of that, we protected children by making sure that they themselves sign consent forms together with their caregivers. For those who did not sign consent forms, we, we then uh, could not uh, go ahead to to work with them in the research. Uh, then uh, I think the last question was uh, on the issue of um, people with uh, mental illness, uh, with their access to SRH services. I think if you go to the slide where I tried to highlight for contextual uh, reasons why uh, what are communication challenges, I highlighted that while this is the most common, common one, uh, visual, speech, hearing, there's also a section for people with learning and um, uh, mental uh, health issues, solely due to the issue of them failing maybe to understand when others speak or them uh, failing to speak what others may understand. So generally, it was not the study was not really focused on the mental health issues, but it touched on some of the issues which they face, particularly uh, on the aspect of them failing to communicate well with others. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Adam, for dealing with those three questions very concisely. Um, I'm, I'm just conscious of our time, and I do recognize that there's two people with their hands up. I'm afraid because of time, I'm not able to take your questions. I invite you, however, to make use of the chat, um, the chat box function. Just please uh, type in your, your questions and our speakers will um, respond to your questions in the chat. I'm sorry, we're not able to give you the platform to speak. 
So this marks the end of our first session this morning on sexual and reproductive health rights. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, all our three speakers for brilliant, brilliant presentations. We were, um, we were intrigued by your presentations and we learned a lot from, from listening to the work that you have done. So thank you very much for sharing your, your knowledge and your time with us. Enjoy your day. And I hope you can stay along for the rest of the conference. Thank you. Without, you're welcome. Um, you. I'd like to also just move us on to our next session uh, on our program, uh, which is titled The Place of Comparative Law in Interpretation and Application of Domestic Laws on Health. Um, this session will be moderated by Professor Charles Nguena, and I will just briefly read out his biography to introduce him, and then he will then take over once I am done. Professor Charles Nguena is a professor of human rights law at the Center for Human Rights, University of Pretoria. He is an expert in constitutional law, human rights law, health and human rights, sexual and reproductive rights, disability and human rights, and race and, the common, cit and common citizenship, I beg your pardon. He has taught at law schools in the United Kingdom, Swaziland, South Africa, United States, and Canada. Professor Nguena is an author and editor of great repute and is the convening editor of the African Disability Rights Yearbook, the first peer-reviewed journal to focus exclusively on disability and human rights in the African context. He has been an advisor on many boards and projects, including the advisory board of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies and the advisory task team to the South African National AIDS Council. Professor Nguena was recently appointed by the Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development as an advisory committee member for Project 148. Project 148, which is being led by the South African Law Reform Commission, seeks to domesticate the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which South Africa signed and ratified in 2007. Professor Nguena, I welcome you to please take over the moderation and I apologize for eating into your time. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Diana, for those kind words of introduction, uh, whether they are deserved is another matter altogether. <laughs> um, uh, so my, my role is really to facilitate uh, discussion uh, between now and lunch. Uh, we have two papers uh, that will speak to the place of comparative law uh, in the interpretation and application of domestic laws uh, on health. And we have two speakers and they have, I, I'm sure they've got many things in common, but what is readily apparent is that both of them have made an investment uh, in disability rights. Uh, both uh, speakers have a master's degree uh, in international and comparative disability law and policy uh, from the National uh, University uh, of Ireland in Galway, um, that is the Republic of Ireland. Uh, so we are very privileged to have persons uh, that have developed uh, this level of expertise uh, in disability. Uh, Vanessa will be the first speaker, Vanessa uh, Makamo. The reason why I just said Vanessa is that she prefers just to be addressed as Vanessa. Uh, she's originally from Mozambique. Um, and she is currently the chairperson of a board of directors uh, for an association uh, for social justice, some uh, presuming this is in Mozambique. Um, 
she has a background and perhaps this is what explains uh, the focus of her paper. Uh, Vanessa um, also has a degree uh, in psychology and pedagogy uh, from the university, from a university in, in Mozambique. Uh, she has a background uh, in education, uh, youth empowerment, and child and health promotion. Uh, so this would explain uh, in a very uh, precise way why she would want to uh, work uh, in the area of the paper she's going to present this morning, uh, which is a comparative analysis of the health promotion policies in early childhood care and education in Ireland uh, and Mozambique. So let me also take this opportunity uh, to introduce the second speaker in this session. Uh, he is Alexius uh, Kamangila, who, as I said earlier, uh, has a master's degree uh, in international comparative disability law and policy uh, from the University, uh, or rather National University of Ireland in Galway. Uh, he also has a Bachelor of Laws degree uh, from the University of Malawi. And currently uh, he is a fellow uh, for an organization where uh, he is involved in advocacy for the abolition of the death penalty and improving access to justice uh, in the criminal justice system uh, with a view to securing a right uh, to a fair trial. He's also interested uh, in the rights of the elderly and has also been working uh, in the field of uh, protecting the rights of persons uh, with disabilities. So he's going to speak on uh, rethinking advanced directives under the microscope of section, or we should say rather article 12 and 25 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So let me first welcome uh, Vanessa. Uh, and then immediately after her paper, we will invite Alexius. And after the two presentation, we can take questions. Thank you. So you're welcome, Vanessa, to make your presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for this opportunity to be here and uh, share my views on the right to health for children with disabilities in, in Mozambique. Uh, first, allow me to send my warmest regards from the Center of Human Rights from Eduard Mollian University from Mozambique. Um, but here I'm Today, I'm here representing Kokola, and uh, I would like to have my presentation um, to guide me uh, while, while I, I, I'm, I'm presenting the topic. Please give me just one minute. So as Professor Charles was saying, I will be talking about uh, the right to health for children with disabilities in Mozambique, comparing the situation in Ireland and uh, Mozambique. This topic, I will start by talking, uh, I will start by bringing a quote by Dr. Tedros from World Health Organization, who says that the enjoyment of the highest eternal standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, 
political belief, economic or social condition. Believing on that, I decided to, to discuss this topic on the right to health because as Professor Charles say, I have experience in Mozambique working in early childhood institution as a principal. And I noticed that uh, we don't have uh, policies promoting the right to health for children in general, not, not only for children with disabilities, but for children in, in general. And uh, I also had the opportunity recently to, to be in Ireland and do my master in disability laws. Being in Ireland, I had the chance to go and see and observe how some early childhood institutions are working and promoting the right to health for children with disabilities. That's why I decided to compare and see what are the best practices that we can learn from Ireland and apply to our Mozambican contest. Going to my presentation, bringing an overview of the presentation, I will start talking about the international human rights instruments, the regional instruments and the national, national framework that guides the right to health. Also, I will be talking about specific aspects on the right to health in Mozambique and in Ireland. At the end, we have conclusions and recommendations. Talking about the international <coughs> instruments, we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on Article 25 that considers health as a fundamental element to guarantee an adequate standards of living for all. It's important here to mention that the right to health, it's important to realize other rights, such the right to education, the right to live, the right to work. And if we start from the early childhood, if we start for the early age promoting the right to health for children with disability, there are more chances to this child in the future to get engaged and to be included in the community. We have also the International Convention on Economic and Social Rights on Article 12 that considers right to health should promote and include prevention through education. Again, the, the, the role of the education to prevent disease and to promote health. I think now on the time of the COVID-19, we can notice that any children, if if you have to cough, they know that they need to put the arm, they need to, to put the hands to cover the mouth. But this, in my opinion, it's resulting of many campaigns that are being done to educate the community, to educate the population, how to prevent for getting the COVID-19. So this is a, this aspect of promoting health through education, it's very important. We have also has an international human rights instrument, the general comment 15 on the committee on the rights of the child that considers that primary care should provide information and service without neglecting the prevention of illness and injury. Going specifically to international, I'm sorry, um, going specifically to the rights of the child on we have the Convention on the Right of the Child on Article 23 refers to special needs and special care for children with disabilities. Article 24 of the same convention recognizes the right to high level of achievement on the right to health. It's important here to notice that it's not about talking on promoting health but Article 24 make clear that it's the high level of achievement on the right to health to all children. We have also the Convention on the Right of Persons with Disabilities on Article 7, promoting the right of children with disabilities. Article 25 on the right to health, share that state parts have the responsibilities to recognize the rights of persons with disabilities to enjoy the highest attainable standard of health without discrimination. So the CRPD brings here any important aspect, which is 
we should not discriminate. Children with disabilities, persons with disabilities need to have, again, this highest attainable standard of health without discrimination. Doesn't matter if I am a poor, doesn't matter if I'm, I'm a person with disability, I need to get the high, highest attainable standard of health, which is something important and we should promote also for children with disability. Um, going to the regional um, contest, I think I have, um, I mixed uh, my, my presentation. We have, and in the regional uh, contest, we have the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, uh, which also refers to the right of persons uh, with disabilities on Article 25, make it clear that all persons with, with disabilities should have the right um, to health. We also have on regional, at the regional level, the Africa Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, which is a very important charter because also mention the right to health in all dimensions, physical dimension, taking consideration the mental aspect and also the spiritual aspects um, of health. Going to the national uh, to the national level, I will talk about uh, first the Mozambican contest, the challenge and barriers that we have to access health for children with disabilities. We have first the geography, which has a huge impact on access to health. In 2017, the population census revealed that 66.6% 6, of the Mozambican population live in rural area and 39% are illiterate, which means they have lack of access to information. Most of the time, people don't have access to information, doesn't know how to prevent some disease that appears. Um, there is also a poor transport system in Mozambique. In, as you see by, by, by the data, most of the population lives in rural area. Living in rural area, they don't have access uh, to health facilities which become more worse when for, for persons with disabilities. There is also an unfair distribution of wealth among population. We are talking about income inequalities. Uh, according to the census, only 22% housing have electricity, only 16.7% housing has top water and 51.3% of the population still drinks water from an unsafe source. As we know, one of the determinants for health is also having access for safe water. And being in early childhood education institution, children with disabilities have more chances to have conditions well conditions to, to guarantee um, their health. Looking to Mozambican national framework, we have in Mozambique the constitution on Article 25, we have the principle of equality and universality. Article 89, we have the right to medical and health care to all citizens. Article 131 uh, talks about childhood and best interest of the child in any circumstance. We also have the equal rights and duties for persons with disabilities. Beside the constitution, we have policies and regulations in Mozambique to promote the right to health for children with disabilities, which are the policy for persons with disabilities, promote health and health education. And we have the decree 53 from 2008 promoting accessibility for persons with disabilities. Specific on the right to health, 
the early childhood care in education in Mozambique start from zero to six years and is managed by the Minister of Gender, Child Social Action and the Minister of Education. Um, in Mozambique, we have policies, some policies and provisions to protect persons with disabilities. As we, we, we can see, we have the constitution, we have some regulations, and we have also some policies. But the thing is that there are lack of provisions to promote the right to health, specific, specifically in early childhood education. We don't have also trained spe specialists provided by the government. We have lack of specialized professions to promote health in early childhood education. And uh, we have also lack of resources in school to support children with disabilities. Going uh, to Ireland, we have also some barriers for children with disabilities in Ireland. Financial barriers to accessing service, such therapy service, including physiotherapy and occupational therapy. Actually, in Mozambique, we also have these problems, and I think it's worse because the, the, the access to this service in Mozambique, it's more reduced than in Ireland. In Ireland, we, we have also social inequalities where persons with more condition, financial, financial conditions can get access to better service than persons with, dis, with disabilities, with, better, with uh, less conditions. Uh, some some aspect interesting in Ireland, Ireland is that they still maintain an admission policy that legal protects a school for admitting or refusing a child uh, with with disability. There is also segregation. Children with disabilities most of the times they are relocated to other education uh, establishment without choices for parents who are pure and this education most of the time are out of, of, of the city. And poverty can be also a barrier to enable children to attend the early childhood education in Ireland. Bringing the national framework in Ireland, the Irish constitution is the instrument that protects children, children's rights, including children with disabilities. On article 40, the Irish constitution brings the equality before the law for every citizen, regardless of their human attributes or ethnic, ethnic, racial, social, or religious background. It's important to mention that the uh, constitution doesn't mention specifically the right to health for children for disabilities or the access to, educa to education on early childhood, on early age. Uh, we have also in Ireland the Child Child Care Act, Education Act from 1991, who regulates the preschool service specifical on health and inclusion from children with disabilities. We have the Equal Status Act, which prohibit discrimination in nine different grounds, including disability. We have also food and nutrition guidelines for preschool service, which is an important aspect for children with disabilities, avoiding to the loss of weight. The child care preschool regulation from 2006 also covers health, welfare, and the development of the child. We have also in Ireland many different policy regulations guiding the right to health for children with disabilities. That's why I was very interested in uh, of learn and and see how we can learn for this practice and, and apply in Mozambique. We have policies to protect health, wealth, health welfare, po policies to guarantee fa facilities to all children. We are talking about sanitary accommodations. We have policies to guarantee good nutrition and health. We are talking ab about food and drink physical layout for rest and play. And we, ha we have specific regulation for infection disease, not to prevent infection disease and to know how to deal in, in a situation that we have this um, infection disease. 
We have also in Ireland qualified health professionals to deal with children with disabilities specifically. We have special need assistants who works directly in class with the teachers. We have supervisors who need to go around the school and see how, how the children with disabilities are treated in each of the class. We have nurses to be there in situations of emergence. We have also educational psychologists and visiting teachers who are inside uh, the class. For example, if we have a children with visual, in, visual impairment or we, we, we have a children with hearing problems, these visiting teachers are there to see and see what kind of accommodations they can do inside the classroom. For example, they can move the child from the back side to, to be in front and near the teacher. We have family workers who works directly with the parents who has a children with disabilities. And we, we have also social workers working in the community to support children with disabilities. Uh, the health service in Ireland also offers psychology service, speech and language therapy service, and also nutrition guide guidelines and home support. One, one aspect to mention here is that these services in Ireland are uh, most, some of them are for free. Uh, in conclusion, I will say that between Mozambique in, and Ireland, on promotion of Article 25 of CRPD the, on the right to health. The Irish and Mozambican constitution does not mention the right to health for children with disabilities in early childhood care and education. But Ireland is better and advanced, better prepared and advanced to provide technical and material support to promote health in early childhood care and education. And this is also an important aspect to mention for me because there is a difference of 10 years uh, between Mozambique and Ireland regarding to ratification of the CRPD. Still, Ireland is in a better situation than Mozambique to provide and uh, promote help for children with disabilities in early childhood education. Uh, Mozambique needs to create conditions to materialize the CRPD and CRC and learn from Ireland from good practice. Because from my experience, it's not that we don't have the policy that can promote. Mozambique, for example, submitted in January um, to the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, this his first report on the right to health. But the thing is, they didn't mention the early childhood education on, on, on this report. So the health, it's just from levels from primary school to university, as I said in the beginning. They are, they are not inclusion of the early stage on promoting health. And uh, we also need to promote health in early childhood care education. Sorry, promoting health in early child care and education allows the early screen of the disease and treatment. And of course, allows the children to be included in, in, in other levels of education. As a recommendation, um, I say that Mozambique need to establish an integrated, integrated early childhood care in education health policies, develop a strategic plan to promote the right to health on early childhood care education. What's happening in the moment is that in Mozambique, we can have one or two campaigns per year to promote health in early childhood education. For example, to reduce the situation of measles or rubiola, but it doesn't enough. It, it's, it's not enough to promote health. For example, I was working in a early childhood education with 189 children. It's impossible to think that we will promote health to all that children only with two campaigns per year. So that's why it's very important to have strategies to promote uh, right to health on, on, on this age. 
We need also to establish a mechanism of support to parents of children with disabilities, where at the end of the day, they are who suffer because they don't have most of the time conditions to, 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 to promote health to their children. Also, we need to make campaigns of health promotion and prevention and activities in early childhood education. Is from since from the early age, well, the child can learn in and in school to wash hands, to cover the mouth when he's coughing, and all aspects related to his personal hygiene. We need also to provide early identification and assessment of needs for children, for example, with minor visual or hearing disability, because we can avoid to in the future in the primary or secondary school to have this, to consider these children impaired or without conditions to go to school, if we can detect that early. We need also to introduce policies on aspects regarding nutrition, diet, mental sanity and physiotherapy. And also I think it's important to continue with the further research on comparative laws to promote the rights of health on children with disabilities in, in different, different contexts. Um, and this is uh, my last slide. Thank you for being here and share these views. Thank you, Professor Charles. Well, thank you very much, uh, Vanessa, for that extremely informative uh, presentation. We learned um, much about Mozambique as well as uh, the Republic of Ireland. And I think that one of the uh, points that you highlighted was that um, there are countries that have not necessarily ratified uh, the convention, but nonetheless, they are politically committed uh, to promoting the rights of persons with disabilities. And that is an important contrast uh, to what has tended to happen uh, on the African continent. Uh, very often, uh, African jurisdictions are the first to ratify a particular instrument. Uh, but when it comes to implementation, uh, they are found wanting. Uh, so that's just one point that I, I drew from your presentation. Uh, and the other point is to do with resources, that resources matter, uh, even where there is political commitment, uh, if there are no resources available, then it's far more difficult to accomplish uh, the objectives. And certainly uh, when you look at the two countries, uh, Mozambique and, and Ireland, uh, Ireland comes uh, out uh, in good light uh, because partly it's a better resourced country uh, with a much smaller population uh, than uh, Mozambique. So thank you very much. We will you know, take questions and encourage uh, those who have questions to put them on the chat uh, so that we can give uh, Vanessa an opportunity uh, to answer those questions. Let me now invite uh, our next speaker, Alexias Smangila. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Um, let me just make an attempt to share my screen. Thank you. So thank you so much, Professor Nguena, uh, for your kind words uh, in the introduction. And thank you, Tariro and the rest of the center for organizing this very important um, conference. Um, as introduced, I'm going to present on rethinking advanced directives, um, sort of analyzing them under the microscope of um, articles 12 and uh, 25 
of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, as a preamble, um, I would say that basically I'm asking a question to say uh, advanced directives, that is mental health directives, advanced mental health directives, are they a solution that legitimatizes uh, the problem? Uh, do they legitimatize the problem? Uh, that's what uh, this conversation is going uh, to maneuver in terms of identifying if it does. Um, as a sort of background, um, I would say that uh, first of all, law and ethics uh, requires that before any treatment uh, is made on any patient, they should be consent. The patient should give consent. And uh, when we discuss talk about consent, uh, there's the issue of um, what it means for the consent to be real consent, not just uh, on paper. So one has to be informed uh, uh, so that they can make an informed decision. And the validity of it all depends on full disclosure. Uh, and then that's where comes the issue of competence of this patient. Uh, so in terms of mental health patients, it becomes a big issue because now there has to be uh, an issue to do with um, uh, the thoughts of the narrative within the loss of mental capacity being equated to lack of legal capacity. And that, as Upper Blum uh, indicates, uh, some of the scholars uh, in this field indicates, uh, demands a balance uh, between respecting autonomy of an individual and then protecting the individual from vulnerability and abuse. Um, this is where um, advanced directives in mental health uh, have been upheld as uh, being very essential in preserving the choice uh, of a mental health patient. Um, uh, that will be discussed in detail as we proceed. But uh, with the coming of the, uh, the coming of the United Nations uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, uh, Article 12 brings universal legal capacity. And that's where the question of this discussion comes up when we make reference to the right to health as provided for as advanced directives in medical capacity. Um, let's uh, get through together and uh, decide uh, with this conversation. So uh, we need to look uh, on the dichotomy of um, legal capacity and directives. Um, and I can't have this conversation without making a reference to um, um, literature in terms of uh, how uh, brief uh, legal capacity, um, which is provided in Article 12, should be understood, understood from at the beginning as uh, providing equal recognition before the law. If uh, disability have equal recognition before the law, should have legal recognition before the law. And uh, as uh, prescribed in this Article 12, uh, legal capacity entails individual status uh, that's uh, uh, as a person and then authority within which uh, this person operates. So uh, uh, this is where it becomes very relevant to understand that legal capacity is in two strains. Uh, there are two pillars to existence of legal capacity. Uh, there's a legal standing and then there's a legal agency. So legal standing is uh, being recognized as a human, uh, as a human being with all aligned uh, endowed uh, rights. So you are basically a hold of rights uh, by the basic uh, need of being or the basic uh, uh, realization of by the fact of being a human being. Uh, the second strand of legal capacity uh, is legal agency. So legal agency is being an actor before the law that you should be able to make decisions and those decisions should be legally binding and accepted by all. Now, 
essentially, if you go back uh, briefly to the introduction, uh, the negotiations of the CRPD, there was a very uh, context, there was a, a, a context uh, or a contest uh, by the states. Most states uh, were more uh, acceptable to legal standing, but were skeptical to a uh, legal agency. Now, but then the uh, Article 12, the first one, uh, had uh, a footnote which uh, sort of gave that uh, distinction, but that was uh, eliminated, deleted, which gave that all states that adopts the CRPD does recognize uh, legal capacity as legal standing and legal agency. Now, to uh, discuss on mental capacity, there's a distinction between what legal capacity is and what mental capacity is. So mental capacity briefly is a decision-making skills, the ability for someone to uh, make a decision whether one has um, abilities or skills required for them to decide on issues. Now, as you can agree, uh, mental capacity varies and uh, uh, there are times that uh, it, fact, it fluctuates. So sometimes even any person, not only people with uh, mental uh, disabilities, every person can say sometimes, I don't know what I was thinking at that time. There's variance all the times in any person without whether you are a person with disability or not. Now, but then the alarm over the fluctuation of mental capacity always is used on people with disabilities. So that's where the discrimination begins. And the interesting thing is legal capacity is static as we understood from the general comment, as well as the interpretation of uh, Article 12. Um, so this is where the issue of mental capacity and legal capacity have to be div divorced. They are not one and the same thing, they're very different. And um, it, it is important to realize that uh, as we go along with the introduction of the CRPD, um, there is sort of a paradigm, paradigm shift away from a substantial decision making to support a decision making in times where there's a variation of mental capacity. So that, that's where we, we come now to realize that we have moved or we are moving uh, away from the uh, paternalistic approach, which was the best interest of the person with disabilities, especially mental disabilities, to will and preference of the person. Um, now, maybe as a comparative analysis in terms of advanced directives. So what are advanced directives to, to begin with? So advanced directives are basically a will, a will or a document that one prepares in advance uh, so that at the time of um, um, emergency, uh, that can be used uh, as their voice so that they can decide on their health. Now, in terms of... Um, mental uh, health advanced directives is with regard to a document that one writes or a record that they make, uh, maybe an audio or a video stipulating what would want, they would want to be done to them at a time that they are considered to have lost mental capacity. Because as I said, traditionally, and in many states up to the present, uh, there is, um, a sort of an interlink between uh, mental capacity and legal capacity, which should not be the case. Now, <clears throat> the issue is, uh, one thing that I would want to uh, make emphasis on is um, the context, the importance of context in our legislation as we are developing uh, different um, uh, legislations that we would want to um, address the issues in, in Africa, especially for people with disabilities. There are differences in terms of our challenges between Africa and Europe and other areas. Uh, for instance, despite having institutionalization as a problem in Africa, it's not something that is a huge, a huge problem as compared to what was in Europe, especially for example, Ireland. So um, Ireland um, in its quest to disinstitutionalize, um, uh, did many things in terms of realizing the right to consent uh, in terms of um, uh, the right to health. Um, just uh, to highlight that Article 25 of the CRPD 
um, on the right to health emphasizes that you need to have informed uh, the, the, any health, uh, any assistance that is given to a person we seek with disabilities, they should be free and uh, informed consent. So that's where uh, the issue becomes relevant that one has to make a decision. So Ireland, uh, from its past of the evils of this uh, institutionalization, came up with the Assisted Decision Making Act of 2015. And I have a lot of problems with this. Uh, I think um, it's wrong from its uh, inception in terms of assisted decision making um, because uh, of this one fact that even in the preamble of drafting or uh, drafting or uh, developing an advanced directives, the issue of competence arises. So when you are drafting this, there is also a question of competence that the person has to be competent, um, which talks about if there's a variation of mental capacity, then that uh, advanced directives is not um, binding. Now, essentially, advanced directives move from um, the acceptability that at some point, someone will lose their legal capacity. They will lose their mental capacity and essentially they will end up losing their legal capacity. So that's where the root cause of uh, how, why uh, the scrutinization of advanced directives becomes relevant. Um, reference uh, making in terms of the uh, assisted decision making of Ireland of 2015, uh, sections 84, 85, and 86. In all those things, you uh, learn to see that uh, the issue of um, mental capacity is too connected to legal capacity, which is wrong. Now, Coming closer to home, Zambia, in its Mental Health Act of 2019, which arises from uh, the Mwewa uh, versus, uh, the Mwewa and others versus Attorney General and another. Um, as well, I have um, a lot of reservations uh, to uh, this act, uh, but to mention that it's still, uh, as we learned yesterday from uh, Felista and uh, Chipo, that there's progress in terms of um, the situation of the 1951 uh, Mental Health Act um, or Disorder, Mental Disorder Act. Uh, but with regard to generally, I would say uh, Zambia still uh, is far in terms of uh, realizing the right to health uh, with uh, uh, people with mental disabilities. And, and this becomes problematic in the context that if we are moving, if we are making progress, then we have to make progress that recognizes legal capacity. So from section four, subsection two, uh, the act itself are clearly stipulates uh, that uh, when one loses mental capacity, their legal capacity uh, is not going to be recognized, um, which entails that uh, the universal legal capacity has been denied. So um, as, as a starter, as a starter, we uh, already, having a 2019 act that misses the plot. Um, but then this is supposed to be a modern uh, legislation. Uh, to talk uh, with regard to uh, advanced directives, um, section 12 on involuntary admission, or rather section 12 that gives interpretation of the words used, uh, gives a permission to involuntarily admit someone. So there are a lot of issues there in terms of the right to health uh, because there's a right everybody at stake, a legal capacity being violated and all that. Um, of key to this discussion is section 24, uh, subsection four, that talks about advanced directives directly and it requires the same issue that I indicated earlier, competence. Meaning um, the advanced directives still uh, do not uh, recognize universal legal capacity in their um, construction as well as in their practice. The problem with all these advanced directives and the new legislation uh, that actually violates uh, CRPD, the spirit and the aspirations of the CRPD is that the um, functional tests still are retained. But general comment one uh, talks about assess abolish abolishing all the assessment tests in terms of uh, dealing with people with mental disabilities because they are discriminatory in the application, of course. 
Now, what is a, a function test? Um, quickly, um, it deals with uh, how one understands information or retains information, how one uses and weighs information uh, in the process of making a decision, and then how and whether one is able to communicate uh, such information. So when any of those becomes a problem, the person is viewed to have had uh, lost their mental capacity, which essentially denies their mental legal capacity. So we see there the interface between legal capacity and uh, mental uh, capacity. Uh, uh, Tina Minkowitz uh, has indicated and has uh, um, enlightened, uh, enlightened us that disability is not a loss of physical and mental integrity. That even where you have a fracturation of mental uh, capacity, you do not lose at any time uh, your legal capacity. I will not take much in terms of the theories of disability uh, because many of us have engaged in this. Uh, just to say that when you uh, evaluate advanced directives, um, they come from a medical model uh, of disability because generally when you evaluate them, you find that they are a tool to decide on options of treatment as opposed to deciding whether one should be treated or not. And in practice, especially in Li Ireland, I'm not conversant with the experiences in Zambia, but in Ireland is that any advanced directives that deny um, treatment completely, they were usually not accepted by the psychiatrists or the medical practitioners. Um, in terms of the social model, uh, social model of disability, um, when we evaluate advanced directives, we find that despite the social model taking disability away from the individual to look at as social uh, disabling barriers from the society, uh, we find that still advanced directives leg leg uh, does uh, legitimatize uh, the social barriers um, in that they disable the person to make a decision. So a scenario, uh, what I want today is not the same thing that I'd want two weeks from now, a month from now. Advanced directives are considered as more important and uh, considered as uh, more binding to them. So a call to um, a human rights model, adoption of human rights model, requires us to move away from advanced directives uh, to focus on the will and preference of the person. And uh, general comment one, uh, paragraphs four and 20, describes this very well. Um, but if not, then the advanced directives should uh, always take the preference of the person and the will of the person even at the time of a crisis in courts, uh, even when the mental capacity has, um, um, has fluctuated. Uh, in conclusion, um, advanced directives is a backward progression. Uh, uh, this is because uh, um, the advanced directives do uh, legitimatize uh, that autonomy is based on mental capacity or one's capacity to decide. So uh, it's condition of existence of mental capacity and um, it's uh, construed as treatment preference versus decision making, which I think is stage constant. Um, it, it does, the problem with it is that uh, it does entrench uh, the, you know, the historical uh, thoughts or prejudices against people with mental disabilities. Uh, in conclusion, I would say that uh, ad advanced directives are a solution that legitimizes the problem and it becomes a problem that requires us uh, to find a solution. Ziko Mokambiri. Uh, Ziko Mokambiri too. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. It's a very fascinating paper and very novel because I haven't come across uh, many other uh, papers discussing the same issue. Um, uh, so we're very grateful for the effort that you have invested uh, in explaining what advanced directives are in the first place for many who might not be familiar with them and also uh, 
telling us about the origins and their philosophical as well as human rights uh, background. Uh, but I think what we would want you to also address uh, is how relevant uh, advanced directives are uh, in an African context. Uh, the idea that uh, Africans go about writing down <laughs> options uh, about treatment when in fact they're not even sure whether there is any treatment available uh, is what requires us to have a discussion around that. Uh, but let me leave this to the audience. Uh, let me uh, say we have 15 minutes, which is not a lot of time, uh, in which to invite questions for both speakers, uh, for both um, Vanessa uh, and Alexius. Uh, I've got a number of questions and some of them are comments, uh, but let me start by asking on behalf of Professor Abuya uh, the question, uh, he asked is, uh, what can uh, Ireland learn from Mozambique? Because I think that uh, he is speaking for many of us in the South, where whenever we look at a comparative study, uh, it tends to tell us uh, about what the African country uh, can learn from the country in the global north. So the, the, we always wonder uh, whether countries in the global north can also learn uh, from uh, the south. So that's one question for you, uh, Vanessa. So let me also identify another question so that we don't go round in circles. Uh, just bear with me a little bit while I find the questions. One question for Vanessa was whether the challenges that are faced by Mozambique are peculiar to Mozambique or are they more widely shared across the African uh, continent? So that's the second question for um, Vanessa. So let me just give Vanessa an opportunity to, uh, to, to answer those questions while I look at the other questions. Vanessa. Uh, yes, um, thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think, yes, there, there, are, there are, I think there are many aspects that uh, Ireland can, can learn uh, from Mozambique. And regarding to early childhood education, we are, as I said, my experience was working directly uh, 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 in, in the institution. And even without having all these material conditions, even without having all these resources and without, without having the policies in place, we still receiving um, children with disabilities in, in, in our institution. We, we still include them in our institution. So for me, I think is most of the thing that they can learn is also that we can work with the conditions that, that we have. But it's important, important also to notice that I was specifically worried with this aspect because I know that we don't have the policies in place. So uh, I, I will not say that uh, uh, in terms of policy, this specific policy, Ireland will learn something because the reality is we signed the CRPD, we have the policies, we have the policy to promote the right of persons with disabilities, but specific for early childhood education, we don't have. And in this aspect, Ireland have. That's why I was focused in learning the best practice for, from what they have to, 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 to implement in Mozambique. But I think that the way we do the activities, the way we, for example, Ireland have a policies which is 
which give the power to the principal to enroll or not a children with disability. We don't have, for us, we signed the CRPD and all children have the right to be in the school. So this is, for example, something that they can learn. We are trying to make all schools inclusive. This year, the government, government of Mozambique approved a new policy starting for 2020 to 2029 to make all schools inclusive. Also, they include the early childhood education on the national program. So we are, we are improving in terms of policy, but at this stage, we don't have in the early childhood education. So that's why I, 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 I was trying to learn from how we can improve more. We have now the policy for inclusion, but how to promote health on, on, on this level. Uh, the second question regarding if is um, similar in other African countries. I think, yes, I think many of the African countries face the same problems, such uh, poverty, uh, the geography situation has a barrier to, uh, because most of the population are in rural areas without transport to access um, to access to health facilities. They don't have, for example, illiteracy. Most of the population are illit illiterate. So I think in some of the African countries, we have the same situation than in Mozambique. And also most of the countries, um, they sign, they ratify the convention, but in practice, we are not implementing uh, 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 the convention. So I think we have similar situation in this sense. Thank you. No, no thank you very much, uh, Vanessa, for squarely uh, attempting to address the questions uh, that were raised. I'm reminded uh, that we should all speak as uh, slowly as we can uh, to facilitate uh, sign language uh, interpretation. Uh, there are uh, a, a number of questions for Alexius on his paper on advanced uh, directives. Uh, so let me, I can see two, but let me begin with the first one. Uh, from Faith Jahira. Uh, the question is, uh, if we are doing away with advanced directives, what then happens in situations of societies where the lives of persons with disabilities are not thought to be worthwhile. Uh, can we offer advanced directives as a tool of advocacy for individuals uh, with disabilities? So that, that is the question from Faith uh, Jahira. And then the next question says, advanced directives are not really popular within the African context. Hence the intersection between legal capacity and substituted decision making. So one, you know, the, this, the, this is a, a question asked by Dr. Ngozi uh, Umer from Nigeria. Uh, she asked whether there are any possibilities of engagement. Uh, so Alexio, uh, you have those two questions. The uh, participants who ask these questions can also clarify them uh, to Alexio if he's not clear about what is being asked. So let me give the opportunity to Alexio. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Nguena. Um, uh, I think the second question, uh, uh, maybe uh, the person might want to clarify, but uh, because I think uh, I took it as if they would want to engage further in terms of the discussion. So okay. I'll start with, um, 
responding to the first question. Um, first of all, I would want to say that um, when I was uh, starting uh, doing this research uh, on this paper, uh, my professor, Professor Frin, was very skeptical about this. And the reason was exa exactly uh, the issue that you bring in terms of advanced directives being um, inherently uh, adopted as an advocacy tool. Um, but then, um, first of all, um, since you uh, mentioned the societies where people's lives that are people with disabilities are not considered as worthwhile, their lives are not considered as worthwhile. Um, my uh, issue uh, with um, promotion of the rights of people with uh, um, disabilities, especially mental disabilities, um, as activists, as policymakers, uh, my always uh, uh, pray or my, 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 my attempt is for us not to ask for the minimum or for the least that we can get. Um, I think advanced directives um, are something that not only uh, does challenge or legitimizes the existence of loss of legal capacity at times of crisis in courts, uh, but at the same time is asking for the least that we can have. Um, as a replacement to advanced directives, um, I think that supported decision making uh, is something that can replace advanced directives. Um, and within supported decision making, it's also a tool that can be used as an advocacy tool. And uh, uh, supported decision making, as we, we can see, and as well as, as we learned uh, from Sherry as well, um, comes in different uh, realm. And uh, a good example uh, is Sherry, who uh, is a self advocate. Uh, and uh, the reason why uh, we need uh, to move beyond advanced directives um, as it offers the minimum, the bare minimum, is also from uh, what uh, Professor Nguena started reflecting in terms of immediately after I make uh, uh, my, presenta my presentation. He talked about the contextualizing of the discussion on advanced directives in the African context. In the African context, our problem actually uh, would begin from treatment, access to treatment in mental health is, uh, is very poor in many instances, even in my country, uh, do not even exist, it's, a, it's, a, it's an alien. So we can begin to talk about existence of advanced directives. So that's where the issue of contextualizing becomes very relevant. And um, that's why I would say uh, that how to make law uh, in terms of improving the rights of people with disabilities, Zambia gives us an example, the mental health Act of 2019, uh, with all due respect and as well as appreciation for the effort that has been done. But that's a good example of how not to make law uh, with regard to the aspirations of uh, the CRPD. So I would say that we can replace advanced directives with supported decision making uh, and ensuring that uh, people of, with mental disabilities become self advocates for their rights. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's the response. As I as I said, the second question seems like a request uh, for further engagement. Unless uh, the one that asked the question might want to engage directly. Thank you so much, Professor. Oh, thank you very much for uh, uh, adequately addressing uh, the questions uh, that have been raised. Um, I know that uh, I could have, you know, perhaps also read out one or two comments uh, from the audience, uh, but I think that uh, we should be mindful of time. Uh, so is two minutes uh, to one. Uh, let me uh, thank uh, Vanessa uh, Makamo. Let me uh, thank Alexia Skamangila uh, for the supreme uh, effort to deliver papers on two very interesting areas and as well as very well researched areas so we are grateful uh, for your contribution and we encourage participants to engage uh, with the presenters uh, so that you can follow up um, angles and dimensions uh, of interest to you.
so thank you very much. Allow me to hand over back to Diana. Thank you so much, Professor Nguena, uh, for moderating that session uh, very effectively. Um, it's now one o'clock um, and it's time for us to break for lunch. We will break for exactly one hour. And can I ask everyone to please be back, to log back into Zoom at 2 p.m. so that we can resume the conference. Thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch break. <laughs>